Okay, hello dance appreciation students. I hope everything is going well for you and your semester is starting off to a good start. And we are now officially starting our first uh, lesson on ballet history. So we've talked about, in the last session we talked about um, how, how the, uh, the cradle of Western civilization was right around uh, Greek, the Greek culture and the Roman Empire and how the beginnings of dance were, were primarily involved with uh, folk dancing and ritual or religious dances. And as theater started to become, as we became more settled and more, um, more of a agricultural society, then we became, we also started doing more theater. And with that, is the beginnings of our theater dance. So we're just going to go right into our PowerPoint. I'm going to go ahead and screen share with you with the origins of ballet. So if ballet did come out of folk dance. Ballet, uh, well, we'll just go to it. Here we go. So screen share. All right, hold on. All right, where did it go? Hang with me, we're almost there. So as you can see, all of the PowerPoints are on the public document page. I know some of people had some, some questions about the discussion. So what's going to happen is I will lecture, I will show a PowerPoint, I'll show some videos, and then you go to your assignment tab and you will get your, um, <clears throat> your assigned discussion. And then you'll have seven days to watch the video and respond appropriately. Okay, so we talked about Apollonian is more ordered, Dionysian is more... That's where the rebellion or, or change comes in. And we're going to go straight into the first ballet. So the very first ballet was Ballet Comique de la Reine. And this was done, <clears throat> this was actually, uh, this was by Catherine de' Medici. She, she was um, a very politically astute woman. The Medicis at the time were the reigning family in Italy, and they also had quite a bit of influence on the Vatican. And she was always trying to sort of assert herself in different uh, courts throughout Europe. So, for example, her niece was getting married to um, the prince, Henry the Fourth of France, and so she decided that in order to celebrate their marriage and to um, stage her prominence in Western civilization and in the court, she commissioned uh, Balthazar de Bougeoyer, the Italian dancing master, to choreograph a ballet. And this was the very first choreographed ballet up until this point. Primarily what you saw were court dances, in, and they were all men dressed in these extravagant costumes, and they were basically doing folk dance, but made slower and more elegant because they had these costumes on. And so this was the first time that there was actually a choreographed ballet that was um, a story, and so the subject matter was mythological, and it was intended to flatter the French and the visiting nobilities and remind all the guests that the Medicis of Florence still controlled Europe and the papacy. So this was also performed only by men, and it was um, and it was a big hit. The French people loved it, and Catherine de Medici then imported lots of things from Italy: their style, their architecture, and and their dancing. So this was this was the very first ballet done in 1581. So you can see the ballet has an extremely extremely long history, but it is very different from the ballet that we know today. So then we had the ballet decor. So inspired by Catherine Medici's uh, big extravagant ballet de la comique, 
Then the men started wearing, you can see these, these um, costumes with the big headdresses and they would parade around, they would do jigs and minuets and it was very, um, they had to keep very erect. Let's think of walking around with books on your head. So it was, they had these big um, headdresses on their heads. And so they had to, they had to posture themselves in order to balance these things on their head and wear these costumes. And we still use that posture in ballet today. So there was no bouncing, it was much more slower, and it was all just the men. So this was the era of ballet decor, so the ballet of the courts. And this was what they did to entertain themselves. You know, they didn't have Outlander or whatever you watch on Netflix. They had court ballets. The most important, probably one of the most important figures in ballet is Louis XIV. So he was um, the king in 1650, and he danced ballet every single day. And he had... Uh, very long, very long legs, and he loved ballet, and he used to love to show off, as you can see in this picture, how he's showing off his calf muscle there. Well, he, that was sort of like what um, abs are today. You know, we like to see men with, with nice, nice upper bodies. Well, back then, people liked to see men with very defined calf muscles, and he, and he had that, and he was very proud of it. And so in a lot of his portraits, if you want to further study this, you can look and see he's always showing off his legs. And he loved ballet. He danced every single day for over 30 years. And he decided that he wanted to start a school. So in 1661, Louis XIV founded the Académie Royale de Dance. And so this was the very first dance school. And in order to um, be able to teach the students and teach his dancers the steps of ballet, he then had to name them. And so he appointed Pierre Bouchamp, who was his private ballet tutor, and together they worked and they codified what we now know as all of ballet. So ballet is done, um, all of the steps are codified and they're all French terms. And that is because of Louis XIV in 1650. He, um, he named each step. So we have tendu, which means to extend, and fondu, which means to melt. And so he had all of the steps codified, and therefore he was able to um, <clears throat> teach the students. And it was, he was able to, to um, pass, the, pass his art through that way. So they met regularly, and, they, and he, he had um, 13 dancing masters. The, the, to establish the standards and perfection of the art of dance. So let's go ahead and take a look at, oops, let's go ahead and take a look at what that would have looked like in the 1600s, okay, and when Louis XIV was, was doing this. So we're going to take it, watch this. Ballet began at the court of Louis XIV, the man who loved to dance and he had beautiful long legs, which he loved to show off. He took dancing lessons for 20 years daily and he was so enamored with dancing that he produced these magnificent productions in which he performed with all his courtiers and the nobility. Um, dancing wasn't the only thing that they had to practice in those days, though. They, they were very keen on their fencing, and in actual fact, the fencing comes before the dancing. And if we could have our two courtiers bring your swords to the centre, gentlemen, we've got with us James Hay and Nicol Edmonds. The reason I want to show you the fencing is because it was very stylized at the court of Louis XIV and already at that period they were obviously very much into the frills and the brocade and it was very stylized the way they fenced and apparently Louis XIV had a fencing school underneath the Louvre 
where he got all his best musketeers trained up. They were wearing these swashbuckling boots. So there is one theory which came from Belinda Quirey, an eminent Baroque dance personality. And she said that she reckoned that the fashion of the boots caused the event of turning out the feet. Because if you can imagine, if they had these big boots on, if they walked with their feet straight forward, they would look very unattractive. So they devised this way of walking. If you just try this, boys, if you turn your feet out slightly and just swing the legs very gracefully, pulled up in the middle, and here we have the beginnings of turnout. Not too much. That's it. Anyway, I want you to have a little look at a fencing salute, which they would have done before they started their actual fight because it looks really stylized they stand beautifully pulled up they have a slight turnout of the feet already and it looks to me really obvious that it's sort of inspired ballet so shall we have a look at that on guard On guard. There we are. <laughs> okay. Slowly with the So we have Louis the Fourteenth. The, he, what's important to remember about him is that he codified ballet. He's the one who named the steps. That's why we have all of our ballet steps in in front in the French language. But but especially, it's important to realize that ballet actually came from Italy and was was came over to France in 1581 with Catherine de Medici's uh, production of Le Ballet Comique de la Reine. And so then, you know, almost 80 years later, we have Louis XIV who loved ballet so much that he started the first dancing school and codified ballet. And so he really is responsible for um, much of the tradition that we know today as ballet. And again, this was primarily all men, well, not primarily, it was all men, until about 1730, when women started dressing up like men and sneaking their way onto the stage. And eventually they were found out, and then uh, we have the women started coming into ballet in around 1730. Um, Mademoiselle La Fontaine was the first female dancer to appear on the roster of the Paris Opera. So it wasn't, so then we have Marie Carmargo. Francois Provost and Marie Salé. These are all of the very like pioneers of female ballerinas. Marie Carmargo was um, particularly interesting to me because she was such a good dancer. She could jump like a man. She could do all of these like um, very, very uh, difficult beating of her feet. And at the time, women had to wear these extremely long dresses even when they were on the stage. And so she actually cut her, she cut her dress so that people could see her virtu virtuosity in her jumps. Marie Salé was known for her expressive, dramatic performances rather than her leaps and frolics like Marie Camargo, that they were uh, rivals at the time in ballet. So this brings us into ballet day action. And now this is really what we start seeing as what we know of ballet today. So uh, Jean Georges Nover, uh, he he wrote he wrote this whole essay on dance and theater and how we needed to move away from the big headdresses and these elaborate costumes and mythological themes and take off take off these costumes that were limiting what they could do on stage and make the themes more uh, relatable you know make them about humans instead of you know sea creatures and so when we see this in the very uh, end of the 1700s early 1800s they start to do more virtuosic um, dances on stage so high jumps lots of beats they uh, they took off their masks they had women and men on stage and they performed a ballet 
the very first one that was that was sort of groundbreaking at the time was La Fille Mal Gardé. So La Fille Mal Gardé translated means the the young woman badly guarded, essentially. And so this was this was sort of a scandalous ballet because at the time, because not only did they take away the costumes that people were used to seeing on the stage. Not only did they add women into the ballet, but they also had a ballet that was about peasant people. And this was this was really important, a very big turning point in dance history. And what happened was this ballet in particular was funny because so she she was this peasant girl. Her mom wanted her to marry up and marry this uh, wealthier man who she didn't really love, and she loved this peasant boy instead. And so she she was um, scheduled to meet her fiance, who her mom had arranged this marriage. And she pushed the peasant boy into the closet, and then she starts fighting with her mother. And her mother says, "Oh, you, you know, you're being so so bad." And so she put her into the closet. Well, compromise back in the day, if you were in the closet with another man for five minutes, then shotgun wedding. So she ended up getting what she wanted in the end and she married the, the young man that she was in the closet with. So we are going to watch an excerpt from La Fille Malgarde. The part that I'm going to show you is known as the clog dance. And the clog dance still in ballet and even today has its roots in folk dance. And you can see in the step dance, it, it looks like sort of Irish clogging um, and that these these folk dance steps are still prominent in the ballets that we see today. So let me go ahead and show you this. We love I love YouTube. What did we do before YouTube? We had to have DVDs. So this is the mother. She's actually dressed like a man here.
So that was La Fille Malgarde. This is also La Fille Malgarde. So that was the first ballet that we see that has taken away the fancy headdresses, that has added women to the stage and has started doing more complicated movements that were um, meant to inspire the audience. And as we move into the 1800s, then women really, really become on the rise as this slide says, to point and prominence. So we have uh, the La Fille Malgarde sort of opens the door to, uh, to more women on stage. And something that was very funny was there was a, um, a flying machine in the production in Lyons in 1794. And it was a contraption that allowed dancers to stand briefly on their toes. So think of like, you know, Peter Pan with the strings and he's flying across the stage. That was sort of what was happening with the dancers. They had these strings that would lift them upward, creating this illusion of lightness as they portrayed ethereal and unreal characters. And so uh, that, was, that was what inspired point shoes. And in 1832, Marie Taglioni was the first female to ever dance on point in La Silphide. She was an Italian uh, woman who took ballet from her father, Filippo Taglioni, and he, um, he worked with her every single day, and he worked on her turnout, and he made these point shoes for her, and she was this very skinny, scrawny, long-limbed dancer, and when she would stretch her arms, he felt like her arms were too long, and so he asked her to soften her arms, to bend the elbow slightly. And that's, that's how we came into this uh, stylized ballet. So La Sylphide is a, is a ballet that was about a, a fairy that only this only one man could see and he fell in love with her and he wanted to make her mortal and so that they could um, so everybody could see her and they, they could they could um, experience their love in its full glory. So I'm going to show you a little excerpt of La Sophie. Oh, I hate this. Here before you know it. Sorry. Hello, Halloween. It's the one night when everybody dresses up. And that includes dinner. Unleash the power of dough. Give it a pop. Well, it's not. Okay, here we go. So he's a Scottish Highlander. That was, at the time, that was a very uh, foreign land, so this was very exotic. Now you'll notice... Her long skirt, notice her soft movement of the arms. Those, are, those little steps are called bores, and that's about all that um, they knew how to do on point back then. So they would just do little walks on their, on their toes, like in this uplifted manner. And always in romantic ballet, their skirts will be long. And there's those little walks again.
and the soft arms and the bent elbows. All right, that's all we're gonna watch today of that ballet. So the three things I would like you to remember about romantic ballet is that it came, um, that was the, that was the beginning of point shoes, okay, and they always wore these long dresses, I mean they were shorter than they used to be, but they still covered their knees. So if you ever go to a ballet and you see long skirts and very soft movements in the arms, bent elbows, um, themes of ethereal, uh, and lightness, then you are watching a romantic ballet. So romanticism deals with supernatural themes and exotic locales. So in La Sophie, at the time, Scotland was a, a uh, an exotic place. And... Um, and usually the, the hero of the ballet is this idealist and then, and then there's some sort of um, conflict and the woman comes and she usually like dies or under un unfortunate circumstances or she's, or she's a sylph and they can never be together. There's always this sort of um, conflict there. My favorite romantic ballet is Giselle and in Giselle the, the woman actually, so she's a peasant girl and she's out in the, in the forest and she meets this young man who is also appears to be a peasant man and he's hunting and they dance together and they pick flowers together and they fall in love and he asks her to marry him and she says yes and she goes back to her village and tells her mother that she's getting married. Meanwhile, there's a young village, village boy who is in love with Giselle, and he knows that the man that she's engaged to is actually royalty and is engaged to another woman. So he calls in the, uh, the court and the royals, they, and they come down, and, um, and the fiancé, the real fiancé, who's, who's part of the royal court, says to her fiancé, why are you dressed like a peasant? I mean, she says it with her, her actions. And... And then he has found out that he has actually betrayed and um, deceived Giselle, and in her and she goes crazy, and in her craziness she dies, and she becomes a willy. And the willies are uh, jilted w women, who, women who have either been left at the altar or been deceived or betrayed, and they die, and they they haunt the forest at nights. And I often wonder if that's where we get the term. Willy, though they gave me the willies, is from this very old story. It's a German story. It's a folk tale, and then they it was um, choreographed in 1845. And so we're going to watch a section from Giselle. So let me get out of this. And this is where so the willies come out at night, and if a man enters their forest they dance the man to death. And so the village boy enters the forest to mourn Giselle, who has um, died of a broken heart. And the willies then dance him to death. And so here is the scene. Now notice the long white tutus. Okay, so it's still a romantic ballet. If you ever see long tutus, it's going to be a romantic ballet. And now these are the the women dancing Valerian to death. And he says, please don't kill me, but they're going to kill him anyway.
And now they're saying, you die now. And there they go, they kill him, they take him off. Lots of jumping in romantic ballets because they didn't have, they, nobody did a pirouette yet on point until 1847. So they primarily used their point shoes just to like do little runs and hops. There's Albrecht, and he's he's the deceiver. Giselle ends up saving him, which is kind of stupid. All right. So, romantic ballet. This is the. Oops. Okay. Let's go back. So the Romantic Age of Ballet it began in uh, 1830s and went until about 1870s. So there's our 1820s, 1870s, so there's a 40, 50 year period there where women were on stage, they had uh, point shoes. And the things that are important to remember when you go to the ballet is that if you see long white skirts or long skirts and a very soft port de bras, which means movement of the arms, then you know you're watching a ballet that was most likely choreographed in that time. And if it wasn't choreographed in that time, then it is stylized after that period of ballet. And so as we, as we start to codify and become more comfortable with romantic ballet, that Dionysian force has got to come up and change it all up. And so that changed with Marius Petipa, and uh, we began, I'm going to skip through some of these, with the Russian ballet. And so Russians during this time really wanted to uh, make their mark as being a very strong court in Western civilization. They wanted to prove to themselves that they weren't this barbaric country. You know, um, they're such a huge country that they have many different cultures mixed in their country. And Catherine the Great wanted to um, really prove herself as a prominent player of Western civilization. And so she started to import talent to her court. And so she would bring in, and they love dance. They have a very strong, Russians have a very strong history of folk dance and a very fine respect for the arts. And so she would bring in um, all of these, you know, at the time of the Romantic period, she brought in Jules Perrault, who choreographed uh, Padicat. She brought in, um, Oh, why am I not thinking of it? Oh, uh, Jules Pro also helped choreograph Giselle, and so she brought in all of these very famous romantic ballet dancers. Well, then we have Marius Petipa, and he was a dancer. He grew up, his father was also studied dance and was involved in the theater. And Marius Petipa and his brother Leon, let's go here, um, were both dancers. And he ended up actually hurting, he actually hurt his knee and he was tired of being shown up by his brother. And so he, he decided to go to Spain. And he learned um, a lot of Spanish dances, like flamenco and like the Spanish style of dancing and their folk dances. And um, he was then imported 
by Catherine the Great up into Russia to the Mariinsky in the Imperial Theater. And there he became a prolific choreographer and teacher. And he really, really changed ballet. And so what he did was he brought in some of his Spanish influence in the ballets he choreographed. And he choreographed over 50 ballets while he was at in his tenure at uh, the Imperial Theater in Russia. So he, um, he choreographed many of the ballets that you may be familiar with, The Nutcracker, Swan Lake, uh, Sleeping Beauty, and so forth. And what he did that was really important for ballet is he started a whole new era. So we just finished, so we had the court, the evolution of ballet thus far has been folk dancing, folk dancing into court dancing, court dancing into choreographed ballets about mythological uh, creatures, and then we move into romantic ballet with the rise of women and point shoes and they had their long tutus and they did lots of jumps on point and they had these sort of ethereal themes and but they were still you know um, accessible then Marius Petipa came and he decided that what he wanted was to make ballet even more have even more virtuosity. He wanted to really um, showcase what ballerinas and ballet masters could do in their dancing. And so he brought back the men. He gave men these gorgeous parts and like big jumping and lots of partnering. And he's the one who is responsible for shortening the tutus. And he did that to show off the technique that he was working so hard with the dancers. You know, he, he's now been able to get dancers to do runs on point. He's allowed, he's, um, he's taught them to do um, full pirouettes, one, two, three pirouettes, lots of turning on point. He has the men doing these grand leaps and beats, beating their legs in the air. And so he is responsible for that. And then as we move into this era of Marius Petipa, we also are moving into the era of classical ballet. And that's really what we, what we see mostly done in the theaters today is more of a classical or, you know, a contemporary. But if you see those like flat tutus and these stories of um, fairies and, and uh, you know, these folk tales that he brought to life, then that's what, you, that's what you're seeing. So we have the Sleeping Beauty, um, Swan Lake, he did all of that. So let's watch uh, a little bit of Sleeping Beauty fairy variations so that you can see uh, what, how he has evolved the steps, the actual technique of ballet and the costuming. So this is the Sleeping Beauty fairies. Now watch their point shoes and look at their costumes. Very different. Straighter arms. Higher legs.
So notice all the hopping on point. She hardly even comes off her point shoes. Right, we're gonna fast forward a little bit. Lots of pirouettes now. This is the lilac fairy. Higher legs. So he shortened the tutu so that we can see those high legs. And turn, turn, and down. Yep. All right. So a little more about Marius Petipa. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he staged 50 original ballets. He gave rise to the role of back, you know, he gave back the role of male dancers and greatly expanded it into what we see today where these men are doing incredible turns and leaps on stage. And, um, and he choreographed, you know, Swan Lake. And Black Swan, just let's be clear, the movie Black Swan is not a good indication of what Swan Lake really is. All right, he had an assistant when Marius Petipa got very ill, and so uh, Lev Ivanov actually had to come and help him choreograph. They worked very closely together, but Lev Ivanov is actually the one who choreographed all of the white scenes, you know, where you see the white swan and all of the, all of her attendees, all the little swan, all, well, they're not little, but all the swans in Act Two and Act Four of Swan Lake. That is all Lev Ivanov's choreography. Marius Petipa did uh, the Black Swan choreography and the reception at the castle in one and three. Uh, Petipa worked very closely with the composer Tchaikovsky, and these are just some of his notes I thought were interesting to show you how closely they worked together in um, collaborating to make these ballets. So, um, hours and hours and hours of collaboration. All right, and we're gonna stop there. This, um, we're gonna stop there and go into the early 1900s when the Russians once again shake up ballet. So I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture today and your discussion on notebook is now open so all you need to do is go to the assignment tab okay so you should have assignments there you go to the assignment tab it should be discussion on the origins on the origins of theater. So what I'd like you to talk about is some of the difference between, I'd like you to talk about some of the differences between uh, romantic ballet and classical ballet, your uh, opinions or thoughts about the origins of ballet. I mean, we know we just quickly went through about three, 400 years of history of uh, ballet, theater, dance. And so I'd like you to just 150 words on the discussion and then comment. I want, I'm trying to um, promote some interaction between, I know this is an online class, but I would like us to still feel like connected and that we are in this together. So um, you write your opinion and then comment with your, with your classmates, okay? Um, 
And I will see you next week. We'll continue with ballet history. We'll take us from 1900s to present day. Have a great weekend. Does anybody, oh, I should ask, does anybody have, I know I have six viewers here. Does anybody have any questions? So you can submit your questions um, and then I can answer them. Okay, well, then have a great weekend and I'll see you next week.